So we are very glad to have with us today uh, Dimos Kazanas, uh, a speaker in our seminar. And uh, I was saying that uh, one at least uh, positive evolution of this new condition is that we very easily can have uh, colleagues and uh, friends from all around the world that can uh, uh, give a talk in the series of our seminars that we also call webinars now. And uh, I was also saying that uh, Dimos Kazanas is not, is not uh, there is no need for any special introduction for him. Uh, everybody who is here knows already the title, Gravity Beyond Einstein, yes, but in which direction? So we can start and there will be at the end time for questions. So we start, Dimos. Well, uh, Pano, thank you very much for the invitation or for the uh, for allowing me to uh, say a few words on uh, this particular subject. Uh, it's a uh, uh, that's a very broad subject, as you will find out. And uh, I uh, try to avoid uh, discussing the math too much. Not that I understand those in great depth, and I'm uh, open to uh, suggestions and corrections if I say something wrong here. Uh, I've spoken to this on this subject uh, several times in the uh, in the academy, and therefore some people have to they will hear those things again and again. But anyway, uh, what I'm going to say is basically collaborations over 30 years with a number of people, uh, mainly f initially with Philip Mannheim, who introduced me to the idea that uh, we should go beyond Einstein. Uh, then. Uh, and then with uh, Joseph Sultana, who was visiting here, and most recently with uh, Dimitri Christodoulou of uh, UMass at Lowell. So let me give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Some of the, uh, uh, well, I'll try to introduce uh, conformal gravity first. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I don't want to really already shoehorn my, uh, my, my talk into a particular point of view, uh, but I will go around with uh, conformal gravity as the main consideration uh, of a replacement for uh, uh, the, theory, the gravity theory that we uh, have, which is we use now is Einstein's theory. Not talk exact solutions, some implications of astrophysics coming from the exact solutions. It seems that the question is, is there a characteristic acceleration in the universe? What's its meaning? A Newtonian limit of valid gravity and uh, conformal gravity at the micro scale in the relation to Higgs. Then uh, a little bit on, I'm not gonna introduce, uh, stay too long on the uh, origin of inertial masses, but I have to say something about it because inertial masses is what really presumably produces gravitation. So the two are related and are they two equal? And if uh, at the end, I will discuss a little bit of phenomenological approach we have with Dimitri Christodoulou on uh, uh, gravity with a G that is variable. Um, I'll say more when we get there. So let me begin with some general considerations here. Uh, you may have noticed that if we, in the absence of G, there is no way of forming combination of physical constants that produces a mass. H bar C, the electric, the electric, uh, the, is, the charge of the electron square and so on and so forth. Uh, so therefore, if we want to have a mass in there, we have to introduce G. But uh, we've been told recently, big discovery that the uh, masses of all particles are given by the Higgs mass mechanism. So here we have two different ways of producing mass. One is from gravitation, which is G, and the other is from the Higgs mechanism. And the two are not the same. And if I uh, may say so, I think this is called the, uh, uh, the hierarchy problem of high energy physics. So uh, if people familiar with this issue, they should, uh, uh, they're invited to say a few more things at the end of the lecture or contact me. And here's the main point. Uh, gravity is the only uh, of the fundamental interactions uh, which uh, whose action is not defined by a local scale invariance. I mean, electromagnetic, now, by now, we know that the, the fundamental interactions, they call them gauge theories, because they have a local invariance principle. And in order to communicate the local invariance across the entire space time, you have to introduce a field that's called a gauge field. 
so electromagnetic as you the strong the weak interactions and the strong interactions they all have uh, local scale invariance principles that determine their actions uh, can we do the same thing for gravity and if we do which one so back in the late 80s early 90s we decided to <coughs> scale invariance under local conformal stretches of the geometry that's local scale environments that is basically the idea that vial came up in the early 20s uh say we do measurements and we set the rulers down there and the question is is this physics independent of the rulers we set uh so let me go into a small digression about gates about uh gauge fields in some sense. You can always, what we learn from uh, vial is that you can always gauge a local, uh, a local symmetry. If I take any action, you can make it locally scale invariant if you want by introducing a, uh, a, a new vector field. That's the, the gauge field. That was, uh, vial explicitly wanted to have the scale invariance in space time. But with the introduction of quantum mechanics, this idea shifted more to the phase of the uh, of the uh, wave function. So, for the uh, for example, if you want to gauge the electromagnetic interaction, then basically uh, you have to want to gauge the phase of the electromagnetic interaction, and that involves the uh, e to the i a mu. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to change the derivative of the, the, the notion of the derivative. So in QED, as some of you know, instead of the derivative being d by d mu, we also add the coupling of the electric uh, charge to the vector potential or to the magnetic field, if there's an external magnetic field. And this is called the gauge covariant derivative. So if you want uh, do that with a space time instead of the phase, then you have to do exactly what Weil did, and you have to change the uh, partial derivative by adding the logarithmic derivative of this conformal factor omega by which you stretch the geometry. So if you do that, then in uh, relativity, you know, you have to do the covariant derivative that involves the uh, Christoffel symbols, which are derivatives of the uh, the derivatives of the uh, metric. Somebody's radio is playing here. <laughs> they are called the Christoffel symbols, the uh, gamma, lambda, mu, nu. If, if you change partial of nu with d mu, then you, besides the gammas that you have, the standard gammas, you have also derivatives of omega. However, there's a combination of the Riemann, Ricci, and Ricci scalar tensors, which is independent of omega mu. That's called the vial tensor. So if you, if you use the vial tensor for your action, then you don't have to introduce this additional field. And you get the benefit of reducing your uh, uh, liber liberty to do things. It's far more tighter uh, theory. So here is the Lagrange, the square of the vial tensor, as I just told you. And then there is an identity, it's called the gauss bonnet identity. Uh, the vial tensor includes Riemann, Ricci, and Ricci scalar. You use the uh, gauss bonnet identity, you can basically remove the Riemann from this expression. And then they take the square of that, and then they effectively, the uh, easier to work with action is the Ricci scalar the Riemann tensor scalar minus one third, the Ricci scalar square. And this action is independent. If you make a conformal transformation, then there are no derivatives of omega that left out. Only uh, actually this action is completely independent of omega. And there is a coupling constant called alpha. We don't know what its value is, but we assume it's of order one. So we use that, that's the uh, reference that discussed that to calculate uh, uh, the uh, gravitational tensor. Once you have an action, I'm sorry to the people who are not familiar with that, but that's 
common in Einstein tend. You put here the uh, Einstein, Hilbert Einstein action, you take the functional derivative with respect to the, uh, uh, the metric tensor, and you get the gravity uh, Einstein tensor. That's the tensor that gives you the gravitational field. And on the right hand side, you put the stress energy momentum tensor of matter. So matter produces uh, gravitation. And when you do that with the higher order theory, you get higher order equations. You get uh, second derivatives of R alpha alpha. And this part is actually well, doable by hand. You can do it by hand. But when you try to do the second derivative of a tensor here, then it gets too hairy, very hard to do the computations, hard to know that you are correct. So uh, the way we did it at that time, and that's uh, the only math, real math I will have, where you write down the metric, the general metric, we decided to go the simplest problem, static spherical symmetric. Then you compute the uh, Lagrangian, which is the uh, vial tensor square from the metric, and you take, you write down the Euler-Lagrange equations. The point is that because this L now has secondary de derivatives of A, B, C, then you have to take, besides the first two terms, which are the usual Lagrange equations that we know, we have to have also take derivative of L with respect to A double prime, and then you have second derivative of that, and you end up with four derivatives in the, in the metric coefficients. If you simplify that, so with the standard coordinates, you still get very, very long expressions, which are basically useless. Fortunately, conformal invariance allows you in the vacuum to set A equal to one over B. And that equation now simplifies into something like what you see here, which now has three derivatives. The one with zero, zero, W zero, zero has four derivatives. But interestingly enough, this is integrable. And that's the solution. It has three derivatives, three integration constants, B, beta, gamma, and kappa. OK. And it looks uh, so basically uh, the gravitation, if you do this, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, if you do the stretching, then the gravitational tensor does not contain the resulting gravitational tensor. You start with the with this value of the expression, you have W mu nu, you make this transformation, the new W mu nu is the original multiplied by omega to the minus six. So let's rewrite the solution. Let's, uh, it has some terms which are easily recognizable. This is a uh, beta over R term. That's uh, like the Schwarz solution. You see, let me remind you what happens when you do the Schwarz solution. You have second order equations. Uh, you integrate once and you have a constant, uh, it turns out because of well, uh, yes, first order, some equations are reduced to first order, const, uh, constant, which is one plus constant over R. And the coefficient of one over R, you call it the, uh, you, you want that to look far away like the Newtonian potential and therefore that's just, you call it two GM. Same thing here, we have something which looks like the Schwarz solution with this coefficient being roughly 2gm, we have a De Sitter solution. The Sitter solution in Einstein theory is, you have to add a term in the team you knew. Here you don't, it's a vacuum solution. But we also have a linear term, which we don't know what it is. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, 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 strong interactions, that looks like the quark potential. The quark potential has a Newtonian term and a linear term. The question is, what's the origin of that? Well, both these two terms out here are asymptotically non-flat. So it's natural to, core, to relate those to the background curvature of the universe. So gamma is like one over our Hubble, roughly. And K is one over our Hubble square. And we use that to uh, model the, uh, uh, how they call it, the accelerating expansion of the universe. So now we can ask the question, when in this metric we expect to have deviations of four to one from Newton? And that's basically when the linear, the Newtonian term is comparable to the linear term. And basically the coefficient of the Newtonian term is uh, the Schwarzschild radius. 
the coefficient, the linear term is one with the Hubble radius. You expect to have this kind of uh, deviation of order one when distances, which are the uh, geometric mean between the Schwarzschild and the Hubble radius. Or <laughs> it turns out that for a galactic, for the ma mass of a galaxy, this is 10, kilo, 10 kiloparsecs. So we said, wow, <laughs> we never thought that we really try to look for something that will explain the galactic rotation curves. However, the solution gives us some characteristic acceleration, if you like, with GM over R square or characteristic column density, which is what we really find observationally in galaxies. Now we said beta equal to zero, then what uh, the remainder uh, of the metric is, turns out it's conformal to uh, Friedman Robertson Walker with some characteristic uh, three dimensional curvature, which is uh, proportional to gamma square and, and the sum of the K and gamma square. So here's the transformation. Here's the metric. Uh, forget about the conformal factor. Oops. What's inside here is essentially a uh, uh, Robertson Walker metric. Conformal factors don't matter in this theory. Uh, so the gamma and K represents conformal degrees of freedom. That is the uh, message that we're going to get out of this uh, solution. Anyway, once we realize that, we try to see if we can fit the galactic rotation curves. And then, uh, as you very well know, the galactic rotation curves rise and then become asymptotically flat. Uh, sorry. And they, these galaxies uh, have an exponential surface density profile, uh, which is sigma zero times r exponential r over r zero. Uh, and this is a particular galaxy, 38, uh, 3198, which is flat all the way up to 10 times R0. Most of the mass, of course, is near here. And if we only had the Newtonian mass, then the rotation curve should look like that. And because we doesn't fit the data, we put dark matter with some kind of this arbitrary distribution. We fit it so that it makes the rotation curve flat. We don't have... if. If indeed this, this geometry that produces the flat rotation curve, we don't have any option. We have to use the, this component plus a constant if that, if that other term is purely cosmological, which goes constant times R. And then you take the sum of that with the Newtonian term. You take the square root of that to calculate the velocity. And this is the square root of gamma R here. And you see that if you put those two together with uh, gamma, which is one over the Hubble radius, you get, well, this in agreement with the data, although far away, if the galaxy continue farther away, the disagreement will become even uh, increasingly larger. And the question I have here, maybe we don't use the, the correct uh, coordinates to do that. Maybe you have to use a different coordinates system and then the rotation curve will be flat. I don't know the answer to that. The, uh, I make an analogy here with uh, with a Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild the city. You have a Schwarzschild the city they, uh, and you try to do the play the same game, the uh, rotation curve should increase linearly. But we know that that's not the case. As the city basically is an expanding universe. So beyond a certain distance, then the, you're taken up by the expansion of the universe. You don't have any more rotation curves and so on and so forth. So it's an issue of coordinate system. And I don't know the answer, whether a, co a different coordinate system would, would produce uh, agreement with observations. So here's more galaxies uh, that we fit that way. And uh, you see that basically at uh, large distances, some small disagreement. The important thing, however, is that there is a relation now between if indeed there's no dynamics here. We found an acceleration component, which uh, uh, without dynamics, we ask now, let's assume that all galaxies terminate roughly where the uh, two terms become comparable. Then there should be a relation between the radius of a galaxy and its mass given by this relation. So the square of that would be equal to the mass of the galaxy times the Hubble radius. 
Now, the galaxies are also virial objects. So besides this relation, they also have the, obey the virial relation. The V square goes like M over R. And it turns out if you remove R between this relation and the virial, you find out that the mass go, we'll show it in the next transparency, goes like the velocity dispersion to the fourth power. This is a well-known property of galaxies called the Tully Fisher or Faber Jackson relation. It turns out that it's not only galaxies that we have this kind of uh, conditions. If you go in addition to the Tully Fisher relations, something people who in the audience who do star formation, they know something was called the Larson relation. Now, Larson noted that the, uh, uh, there is a relation between the velocity dispersion in the star forming regions and the mass. And uh, it turns out if we write now the virial, those are also virial objects, B, the velocity goes like gm over r, and where I also the acceleration, gm over r square is equals to ch naught, that's the characteristic acceleration we found from the conformal gravity solution with no dynamics. Then you can remove, you can eliminate R from these two relations and you find that V to the four goes for velocities one kilometer per second. So we, we choose here one kilometer per second. The corresponding mass should be a hundred solar masses. So for objects, star forming regions with velocity dispersion about one kilometer per second, the corresponding mass should be a hundred solar masses with this coefficient. V to the four goes like mass. And the normalization is exactly that. And the normalization here involves CH naught. That's the interesting thing, that CH naught appears not only on galactic scales, but appear on scales which are well within the galaxy. Now, if we change the velocity here for one kilometer to 100 kilometers, then we'll increase the mass by a factor of 10 to the 8. That will be 10 to the 10. So here I have now that point is the mass of 10 to the 10 as velocity 100 kilometers a second and mass 10 to the 10. This is the, the Faber-Jackson relation and this relation extrapolates into that one. Now, the coordinates are upside down here. I, I have the mass on the vertical and the velocity on horizontal, which is the other way around in the other uh, transparency. Uh, and this is kind of amazing in the sense that people who do star formation, they're familiar with this relation, but they don't understand, they don't, I don't think they understand that this relation extrapolates into the Tully Fisher relation and the other way and vice versa. People who do a galaxies, I don't think they really have any idea that their relation extrapolates within the galaxy now onto in the, in the independent uh, Co uh, condensations that we call molecular clouds. Uh, this is the, this diagram shows the M sigma relation. You may have heard of that. It's given by, uh, uh, by uh, Merritt uh, and Dave Merritt. And it has the same form, except for it's displaced from the Tully Fisher by a factor of a thousand. If for some reason we find out that the black holes that grow in the center of the galaxies they only eat 0.1% of, uh, uh, of the available spheroidal mass, then we have the M sigma relation. That's something that's not done yet. Uh, molecular clouds do the same thing. And uh, in this case, now, instead of using mass versus velocity dispersion, you can use velocity dispersion versus radius and have the same slope, slope here is a half. It's again the same slope. If you eliminate the mass instead of the radius, then you get V versus uh, R and you have the Solomon relation. I've done that schematically here, all virialized systems, and you find out that the protostellar nebulae are here. This is the R squared equals M relation. Here's R and this is M. So this is R square root of M. And this is the black hole, R equals M. It turns out the universe is on top of that. And the virialized systems that we know, this is only schematic. I haven't put all the data there. 
galaxy clusters are not like that. They're a little bit below here. That's my understanding. The form of that. So somehow the various systems, when they form, they somehow know about this characteristic acceleration or characteristic column density. Anyway, and to stretch that even to the extreme, I can extrapolate 60 decades and I, I write down the, that's the radius versus mass. It turns out the electron lies on this extrapolation of this relation. It turns out, as I said, GM over M over R square is equal to the hub, uh, one over Hubble radius. Uh, so column density, all these objects have the same column density. So the electron has the same column density of the universe. This is rather fantastic. <laughs> uh, uh, is, it's not a result, a fantastic, maybe it's a numerical coincidence, but nonetheless. Uh, who cares to look at the column density of the electron, the column density of the universe and compare? Well, the only reason we did that is because we came up with that uh, solution from the uh, Weyl equations. So we can do some more solutions. Now we can put an electromagnetic. If you want to use conformal theory, then you have to use conformal invariant Tim Nu on the other side. So we know that electromagnet electromagnetism is conformal invariant, and therefore we can uh, uh, calculate that. Oh, so uh, the characteristic acceleration, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Some of you are familiar with what's called MOND, modifying Newtonian dynamics. That's a theory of uh, Milgram's to basically calculate, to explain why the rotation curves of galaxies are flat. That will be at the very end of my talk. Uh, so we use this as a team you knew, and we can calculate now the new metric. It turns out, again, we can integrate the equations exactly. And we have all the terms that we had before, except now for the Q, we have a term which is Q squared divided by alpha. Alpha is the coefficient in front of the uh, uh, gravitational tensor, dimensionless constant of order one, divided by gamma R. In Reister Nostrum solution, that's the Einstein solution, uh, Einstein gravity solution with a charge, you have Q squared over R squared. Why? Because Q squared is multiplied by G, and G has the uh, uh, length scale square has the proper powers of length scale to cancel the length scale square in the denominator. This g q square over r square. Here, there's no g. That's very fundamental. To make this coefficient dimensionless, we have to multiply that with a curvature of the universe. That is a rather surprising result. To me, at least, it is. Uh, and now in, in fourth in vial gravity, and I guess in all fourth order theories that don't have a G, the charge contribution to the geometry has the same functional form as that of the mass, like one over R. And because the theory does not have a G in the action, this is a funda, uh, this is essentially the main theme of my talk. We have, to, if we wanna stick to this theory, we have to understand what is the role of G. Because in uh, when we do astrophysical uh, modeling, we have to add a G in there. Either with a black hole or with the galaxies or with the universe, we put G in there. We assume that G is constant, is given by God, and it's in the Lagrangian of the gravitational field. And all our field theories, they basically try to quantize this theory, and they know right off the bat that they have problems because you cannot quantize something that has a dimensionful constant in the action. Uh, so there is a question is what is the Newtonian limit? Now we have fourth order theories that if you uh, uh, by any chance open uh, uh, Eddington's books, you find out that it's very explicit about that. Fourth order theories are very, very different from the second order theories we know. So I have a, I'll spend a few minutes discussing that. If we take WRR, it's this combination, the third derivative and so on and so forth. The W00 has a four derivative in it and has other terms which are very similar to the other terms. So we take this combination, zero, zero, mixed, minus RR mixed, all the other terms cancel. And we have four derivative of B minus 
four over r, third derivative will be. And this is the fourth, this is the fourth order Laplacian. This is kind of amazing because all those are basically totally nonlinear expressions, but then out of that, a linear operator comes out. Now we have a linear operator. We can calculate, if we find his Green's function, we can do what we do in electrodynamics. Then we basically take, it turns out integrals of the uh, given density with the Green's function to calculate the potentials. It turns out that the Green's function of this operator is, is not one over R minus R prime as it is for the uh, uh, Laplace operator. It's R minus R prime. And with, R, one of, with a Laplace operator, we have one over R minus R prime and we do the integrals over the distributions of matter. And we start with a Newtonian uh, potential and you get Newtonian potentials. But if this is linear, how can we ever get Newtonian potential? It turns out we have to do exactly the same thing we do with the, uh, with the standard ENM. You integrate that over some distribution. And if you do that, then the integrals are a little more complicated, but eventually you get uh, a term which is linear, a term which is one over R, it, a, a term which is constant, and a term which is quadratic in R. So basically, if your like grand, if your, your Grinch function is linear, then the interior of a shell is a de Sitter space. It's not a flat space as it is in, in uh, Einstein or Newton theory. And in this case, so how do we end up getting Newtonian potentials? You get Newtonian potentials because of cancellation of this linear term around the source. So this is a rather, so this, well, fourth order theories, if you insist that we don't have a second order theory, just the fourth order theory, they turn everything we knew about gravity upside down. The Newtonian potential is just the short distance limit to this theory. If you ask people who do uh, quantum gravity and they add, they have the Einstein term, Hilbert Einstein term plus higher order terms. And they say, well, the uh, Newton term is the long distance to the theory and the short distance is something invented with the Planck, uh, Planck scales. If you don't have the Einstein, Hilbert Einstein term in the Lagrange and then the Newtonian potential is the short distance limit to the theory. And the Newtonian contribution is the fourth moment of, of the distribution you put in there. When we wrote a paper, immediately the referee, which I thought it was Cliff Will, said, well, there you're obviously wrong because if you uh, double the size of an object with constant density, then the, pot the gravitational potential becomes, instead of being doubled, becomes 32 times larger. And the answer is yes, that is true if if f of r is positive definite, or if it's a delta function, the point like the, uh, the sources of the, uh, of the standard Newton theory or Einstein Newton, if you like, are the delta functions. Conformal, conformal invariance requires invariance under stretching, and you cannot stretch a delta function. So the sources must be derivatives of a delta function. If you put the second derivative delta function, then this you avoid this issue and you have something which becomes constant. So, but all that said and such, we don't have a clear cut. This is a model theory of f of r. Uh, the delta function gives us the coefficient of the gamma and the second derivative delta function gives a coefficient of one over r. So here is my, the main point I want to drive here. By now, I guess you figure out that I, uh, when I say in which direction, I mean the direction of uh, conformal gravity, uh, not necessarily with this unique Lagrangian that I wrote down, but maybe some variations of that, which is still conformal invariant. I'll try to stick on this uh, idea of conformal invariance. Uh, my main question here is that I haven't worked on this theory for a while because I don't understand what, if I wanna do a galaxy, then I have to know what G is. I have to know what kind of mass I put in there. Maybe I can, a GM is the issue there. Maybe GM 
it appears that most galaxies work, well, except for if you go to the side of the galaxy, then you find out that they're flat and they shouldn't be. Uh, the solar system works, mainly because we don't go sufficiently far away from the solar system, but the, we, we don't measure separate G and M. We think we know G and what we measure gravitation is GM. Okay, maybe that's the way it works. Uh, but the theory says that the G in principle, uh, it will be variable. So uh, I played around a little bit with it. I rewrite the, this action, as I told you, I pull out an R alpha alpha. Why? Because this is the action of Einstein theory. And the remainder, I say, let's, this remainder, you'll be an effective, Einstein theory has one over G times R alpha alpha, integral of that over the force over the over the entire space space time so i said well let's try this to be the effect an effective one over g uh, which means that this is the in filthy theory parlance the square of the planck mass for conformal gravity now we have the exact solutions. I can plug the exact solution here for the static spherically symmetric case to see exactly what happens to the effective plug to the effective G as a function of R. So when I plug it in here, do we have this parameter beta in there? If you remember beta gamma and K, uh, I set K equal to zero. I am simplify the metric. I find out that this factor, which is one over G, which is the Planck mass square, goes to zero, goes to zero at R equals three beta. So the Planck mass, if this is the effective G, it should go to zero as you approach the horizon, not actually the horizon, but three halves the horizon. That means that quantum gravitational effects should become microscopic near the horizon. And that's a totally different point of view that we have. We believe that the microscopic horizons are there now. There are issues about the Hawking radiation, which have not, as far as I know, have not been resolved. But if somebody knows better, you can uh, inform me. Uh, so as I, so this is the an issue here now. Once we stick to this theory, then we all of a sudden I'm founding that I'm, I'm confronted with the issue that the black holes that I knew that are a little bit different now because they become actually, it appears to me at least, and I don't know what people with the audience think, it appears to me they, they want to become quantum objects. Uh, as I said earlier, the absence of G is, there's no way to introduce mass. Uh, however, we know that the, uh, uh, the mass energy source as a mass in the Lagrangian. I discuss all that. However, nowadays we know how to produce mass. Mass comes from the Higgs field. Those are the initial masses, but by equivalence principle, there's also the gravitational masses. So, and all that done in flat space. Well, how is that possible? I mean, <laughs> we ignore gravity when we try to, when we do the mass. Well, mass is intimately related to gravity and we have now two different scales. One is the Planck scale that comes from the observed G, and the other one is from, uh, from the Higgs field. And the Higgs field, Lagrangian, is a scalar field with a potential there, and we put the potential, they have this form, that's the M is the mass of the Higgs, uh, lambda phi to the four, maybe you know, most of you probably know, the Mexican hat, how the uh, Higgs gets a vacuum expectation value, and then you couple fields to the mass of the Higgs, and therefore, the W and the Z get mass, and presumably all the other particles get masses with the proper coupling of the uh, Higgs field to the, uh, uh, of its field to the Higgs field. That's the number. So the mass parameter again is introduced to the Lagrangian. It turns out now with a, uh, I don't know, I, I, have, I have to apologize to uh, people who are more familiar with field theory, I've been trying to find somebody who can really uh, enlighten me on these issues. I, I haven't found one, but uh, hopefully somebody from the uh, uh, audience that's sufficiently familiar with uh, the workings of field theory can uh, 
call me up or send me an email. We can have some more discussion on that. Uh, you can do now what's called quantum corrections there, the, the loop diagrams. And it turns out that loop diagrams involve something called the propagator, which is the mass in the, and the momentum in the back. But because they're loop diagrams, they don't, they can, they don't have external relation to the outside world. They just basically things that come up the vacuum and disappear. And therefore you don't have to conserve energy there. You can send the momentum or the energy to infinity. And you find out that they involve integrals like that with the L is lambda is the scale over which the momentum goes. You can send that to infinity and those diverge quadratically. Or because we don't know how, we don't want to send them to infinity, they should go to the Planck mass. And therefore, instead of the Higgs mass, we should get the Planck mass. And it is my understanding that this is called the hierarchy problem. I mentioned that earlier. The discrepancy between the masses we get from quantum field theory, the Higgs, which is observed, and the, uh, uh, and the gravitational Lagrangian, which is the Planck mass. So this discrepancy that comes out here, and Presumably, this supersymmetry was supposed to resolve that issue because the uh, the loops cancel, fermion and boson loops cancel each other. But we haven't found supersymmetry, so we have an issue here, which we don't understand. So here is a paper. I did find a paper. These authors have several papers on this particular sim uh, issue: conformal symmetry in the standard model. That was slide twenty-three that I mentioned earlier. Uh, conformal invariance is only broken by the explicit mass terms of the scalar fields. All the other fields that we have in there, SU2 cross U1, the uh, uh, electromagnetism, SU3, those are all conformal invariant. They break the conformal invariance by the uh, by coupling to the uh, mass of the Higgs. And of course, if you put an explicit mass of the Higgs, then this loops diverge, so we have some problem. It's called the hierarchy problem. And as I said, it's proportional, the divergence is proportional to lambda squared. So just here's to show that what I said is, well, maybe I don't understand it terribly in depth, but uh, other people sort of agree with the words that I said. So uh, now if we, uh, insist on conformal invariance, then the obvious thing to say is that, well, we know how a scalar field should also be conformally coupled. It should not have a mass, absolute mass in there. Conformal coupling tells you exactly what the effective mass should be. That should be the local Ricci curvature, the local Ricci scalar. Well, so, the local Ricci scalar plays the mass of the, it should play the mass of the Higgs if conformal invariance is correct. Well, how is that possible, you said? Well, because how do we calculate our alpha alpha? We calculate our alpha alpha from the Einstein equations, right? This is the Einstein tensor, we take the trace. And our alpha alpha is comparable to that. And this is equal to, this G is different from that G. G rho. G is the Planck mass, one over the Planck mass square. Rho is the Higgs mass to the fourth power. So R alpha alpha is the Higgs mass square, okay, multiplied by this very small fraction, the, Planck, the mass of the Higgs divided by the mass of the Planck square. So it cannot be that. Well, the mistake you make by doing that is if you insist on conformal gravity, you don't want to use the Einstein tensor here, but you have to use the W alpha alpha tensor, the W mu nu tensor, take its trace, but that's proportional to our alpha, alpha square. And therefore, now the mass is comparable to the mass of the Higgs square. If that's the case, then if you insist on that, and you see that's a train of thought that, it, yes, it a, has a couple of steps, but it tells you that quantum gravitational effects should be present at the LHC. So here is, uh, as I said, I mentioned uh, what I discussed uh, so far, I somehow I've already given a talk in the academy over the years, but these are new insights, relatively new insights that uh, I have. 
And this was discussed as many of you who follow the, uh, uh, the literature or the, uh, the newspapers and you find out that people were talking about quantum gravitational effects at the, uh, at the LHC, the creation and annihilation of mini black holes and so on and so forth. Uh, before we get there, conformally variance, that's its essence, preserves the structure of the light cone. So these are general considerations here, which means if you start the universe without a black hole, you can never form a black hole because conformal invariance does not allow you to change the conformal structure. You can form something which looks like a black hole from far away, but it never has a true horizon. Maybe it has an apparent horizon, but it never has a true horizon, which means that there's no region in space where the light cone is tipped because if you tip the light cone, then it, essentially time progresses towards r equals zero. So nothing saves you from hitting the singularity. So then the question is, how is that possible? How can we not make a black hole? I mean, they, it's not we have to go to extremely high densities. It's just the conformal, the effective G will change. That's, uh, so what will be the interior of a black hole? Here's my conjecture. People have made conjectures. I'm allowed to make one. It's a free country. It's the unbroken, the interior of a black hole is the unbroken Higgs vacuum. So when you send material to fall into the black hole, from far away, it looks like it's fallen. They, uh, you lose the multiples, all the multiples, except for the uh, monopole. But when it gets very close to the horizon, how close? Close, as close as the inverse Higgs mass, I guess. That would be a maximal, uh, redshift you have. Then uh, the symmetry gets, this is a conjecture, symmetry gets restored and you get something which uh, for those who are familiar with uh, gravitational uh, uh, issues, they called gravistars. Gravistars is some structure with try to basically avoid singularities and they replace the interior of a black hole with the, uh, uh, the sitter vacuum. Of course, the sitter vacuum, you cannot keep it like that. So they put a very, thin shell of matter that contains effectively most of the mass to hold it down there. And I call the Gravastar. Uh, you can Google that and find out exactly what it is. Uh, this is so, something very different. The mass never forms a black hole, never forms singularity. If you like, the battle for the singularities will be won at what near what we call the horizon, not near r equals zero. Uh, so, as I said earlier, gravitational phenomena of the LHC has been discussed as an issue, as a resolution of the hierarchy problem. That's uh, one of, uh, and this was done by introducing extra dimensions. So, how do you resolve this? You want to bring the Planck mass equal to the Higgs mass. Well, you can only do that if you make the gravity stronger, namely decrease the uh, effective uh, uh, Planck mass, if you like. <laughs> And you can do that by having extra dimensions and they can be either curled up as uh, Arkani Hamed and my friend Savas Dimopoulos discussed, or it can be large extra dimensions, which means that as you go toward R equals zero, you take a particle toward R equals zero, the gravitational force becomes stronger. Because like instead of R to the minus, the, is the potential instead of R to the minus one becomes R to the minus six. So by the time you reach the distances as short as the mass of the Higgs, then the gravitational force is comparable to the uh, uh, strong force. So you have Planck mass equal to Higgs mass. And that was the reason that people suggested that the LHC now will have uh, many black holes and gravita quantum gravitational phenomena. So uh, riding on this uh, speculation, my friend Argyris Nikolaevis and I, we uh, said, well, if that's the case, then there should be features in the cosmic ray spectrum that appear when at center of mass energy comparable to the uh, uh, mass of the Higgs. So we wrote it because then energy would be lost in what's called the bulk. That's the randall sundrum uh, model. The volume of the universe is much larger because uh, we have a huge volume in the bulk where the extra dimensions live and we live on the brain. So we said, well, maybe we can calculate that and uh, so on and so forth. So here is the cosmic ray spectrum. 
And you can see there's a definite break, was called the knee, the cosmic ray knee. Uh, and this energy is about one TV center of mass. Uh, and that's what roughly the Higgs mass is. So the idea was that once you approach the, uh, the mass of the Higgs, energy is lost in the bulk and therefore the cosmic ray spectrum bends over. Of course, this is a much more complicated issue because you don't know the origin of the cosmic ray spectrum and so on and so forth. However, apparently, I haven't heard much, uh, anybody talking much about this uh, issue of mass loss of a quantum gravitational effects in the Higgs, uh, at a Higgs scale. However, there is missing energy at, LA, at the LHC, as my friend Ari Yiris and I discussed uh, about uh, 20 years, almost 20 years ago. <laughs> so uh, here I got this from some presentation that happened to our gravitational group by a, a lady that works with Atlas. Uh, so there are events which basically are Higgs going to invisible matter. So here is one. Uh, on the right here is the projection along the direction of, the, uh, of Atlas. And here's the three-dimensional uh, uh, depiction of that. There's one jet in that direction, one jet in that direction, and missing energy of 564 GV at some random direction. And of course, an obvious thing is that are neutrinos, and you get neutrinos by having Higgs going to a pair of Zs, which go to a pair of neutrinos. Apparently, this happens only in uh, one in a thousand interactions. Well, however, they see this type of event set of the order of 26% of the time. Now, I make a point here. This is, in this case, this 26%, it's a, only an upper, a upper limit because all this complica very complicated interaction. So you have to basically figure out what is a true event with missing energy and what is not a true event and so on and so forth. But there appears to be a missing energy. And now if am I allowed to uh, uh, speculate here, and people have made careers through that. So, uh, well, if this is a gra if gravity is indeed a uh, strong interaction of the Higgs, then this could be something that involves gravity. If it's a particle instead of gravitational waves, if it was a gravitational wave, it has to be a, a very nonlinear gravitational wave because uh, its wavelength should be comparable to the uh, Higgs mass. <laughs> to the Planck mass, if you like, the effective Planck mass. Let's assume it is a particle-like, which held together by its own gravity. I call it a gravity ball. So if I uh, am allowed to speculate here, I said, well, maybe there are things that are called gravity balls. It turns out that people think that uh, those are something that it's called long-lived particles, LLPs, that are particles that we don't know about that generated there and they small cross-sections, they escape and they decay outside CERN. So they, I heard, I don't know if that's true, that they plan to put detectors in the parking lot of CERN so they can catch the decay products of that. I don't know what, uh, this is not my field, but I, I sort of entertain, I like this uh, uh, the term gravity ball. So we're getting, well, uh, close to the end. Uh, one thing, not too many things about gravitational lensing. The, uh, one thing I tell you, once we got the, uh, the original solution of the, uh, of the vial of gravity, I said, well, let's do the uh, uh, gravitational lensing. Well, to my surprise, I found out that the deviation angle, it's proportional to the para impact parameter. <laughs> and that's totally nonsense. If you try to do if you forget about the gamma term, you put only the KR term, it turns out that the KR term gives you zero. It does not change at all the gravitational deflection. It turns out that is also not true. And the difference, and the, the error is because if you try to do the gravitational lens bending, you, you ignore that the background space is not asymptotically flat. And therefore you have to be very careful how you define angles. And once you define angles correctly, as I said, I don't want to really spend too much time here because the, I'm getting close to the end of the 
session here, we find out with uh, Joseph Sultana, who is a university of Malta, that the angle change is proportional to the standard, the Einstein component for B over, for M over B, B is the impact parameter. And then it includes a term which is uh, the mass squared times the gamma. And this term is small. If beta gamma is a, is a small parameter, that's the Hubble radius, the Schwarzschild radius, so that's the inverse Hubble radius. If that ratio is small, this component, this correction is, is small. And therefore, yeah, we don't expect the linear term in the solution to make a uh, big change in the gravitational bending. Of course, you knew that ahead of time because as I mentioned that the uh, gamma and the kappa terms are conformally conformal degrees of freedom and conformally uh, conformal uh, transformations do not change the uh, trajectories of photons. They can change the trajectories of particles, but not of photons. So, uh, of course, there is a coupling of the gamma and the beta terms, and that term is small. Uh, I discussed the issue of accelerating charges and the uh, invariable inertia. Uh, once you accelerate, you, you know very well that inside a, uh, a shell, the uh, metric is flat or there's no forces. Newton showed that there's no forces. However, if you have particle that accelerates inside the shell, then the, the lines of force from the particle, uh, there's a characteristic horizon there, if you like, and they, uh, the lines of force break, and therefore the force that you, uh, between a particle of mass M2 and everything else in the shell has an additional term one power of r is j is replaced by the acceleration divided by r. And you can do the integral over the entire shell. If the entire shell is the universe, then the gm over r, uh, gm over c is the, uh, uh, the Schwarzschild radius of the universe and the radius of the universe r is comparable to Schwarzschild radius. And hopefully you get that f is equal to m times a. And, uh, we did that with uh, that's originally thought by uh, Dennis Yama and then uh, uh, Michael Berry and uh, Joseph Sultana and I had a couple of papers on that. And it turns out that that integral, it didn't give a if it was make, it was uh, one third MA, one half MA, uh, and so on and so forth, basic on what kind of uh, cosmological parameters you use. But the bottom line is, even in this simplified model, Inertia here is viewed as a resistance to acceleration due to Newtonian forces by the masses distributed in the universe. And that's Mach's principle, effectively. Uh, the, what I really wanted to get out of here is get the characteristic acceleration that we found in biogravity. It seems that it doesn't come up here, but we had, we had another try. Let's assume that the G now depends on, uh, on the scale factor A. We play the same game. We find that if f again equals ma, and we have an integral over redshift of the distribution of matter over redshift, which depends on sigma. And we find that if sigma is minus three halves, then we get f equals ma. Now, sigma is the uh, scale factor. In matter-dominated universe, the scale factor goes like t to the three two thirds. So this would imply that G goes like one over the time. And that's, uh, this is actually uh, Dirac's uh, uh, estimate of uh, Dirac's proposal that the uh, gravitational constant decays like one over time. As I said, I would, I could spend more time on these uh, issues, but I can, uh, there's no time left at this point, which already hit uh, past the hour. A variable G. So now we have to talk about, we cannot really talk about uh, uh, galactic dynamics and not measure Milgram. I mean, Milgram, that was a genius of Milgram that to, to realize that what really is, makes the galactic rotation curves flat is not the pot the, that the gravitational potential instead of becomes logarithmic at large distances or the force becomes one over R, is that it involves a characteristic acceleration. So he said, instead of F equals MA, we have F equals M 
times a function of a over a naught that call x. When accelerations are much larger, this characteristic acceleration, we have uh, mu equals one and we have f equals ma. At small acceleration, smaller this characteristic acceleration, which is the age of the universe, the, uh, the speed of light divided by the age of the universe. There's something cosmological there. There's no question about it. Then the density, the energy per unit mass becomes proportional, the uh, force per unit mass becomes proportional to the square root of the acceleration you have, the Newtonian acceleration times this characteristic acceleration. So now we go out and you say centrifugal force is equal to this force, not to gm over r square anymore, but the square root of gm over r times say zero, then the r's cancel out and you find that v goes like the fourth power of gm a naught. And from here, you can find out that the masses, now they have to go like v to the fourth. There's no dynamics in creating galaxies here. This is after you have created the galaxy, then you realize that this is the case. And this is called the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, tully fisher relation again, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so with Dimitri Christodoulou, more recently, we said, well, instead of trying to really change the, of course, you can say that this change is because you change the inertial mass of the object at low accelerations. And that was the, the that was the, uh, uh, our goal with uh, Joseph Sultana, eventually to find that the accelerator, the, uh, uh, calculating the inertial masses, the way we did it in the previous uh, transparency, it we involve the size of the universe and therefore involve some characteristic acceleration may not, we found out it didn't. But with the meter said, okay, so let's see, instead of G, we have a, some constant. This is essentially a, vari a variant of what I discussed earlier. We don't know what G is, but G now cannot necessarily be constant if it's a combination of geometrical parameters. So let's say that G is some constant times, which depends on acceleration. So now we can solve this for A and you find that a is the Newtonian component, which involves G0. That's the Newtonian, G0 gram mark, and involves basically this expression that involves A0 and the Newtonian acceleration of a galaxy. Very quickly, you can show that in the, uh, if the Newtonian acceleration is much greater than A0, we have the standard expression, the F equals MA. But if the, accel if the Newtonian acceleration is much, much smaller than A0, we get the Mond result. It's the, this plus, uh, well, we get essentially the square root of the Newtonian acceleration and A naught. And we can explain the galactic rotation terms. In this case, then the G will have a constant component plus a component that increases linearly with R. Uh, so, I think I'm pretty much come to the end of what I wanted to say. Uh, I would like to sort of figure the conclusion, but they, the essence here is that if we really want to put a invariance theory, and by now I think that I put my stake all my money on conformal invariance, then there be there must be an effective G, which I don't know what it is, but I do challenge the the audience to think about it and contact me if they have some good ideas, uh, which will vary both in time and in space. And this will be fundamental in understanding the uh, 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 astrophysics. And as I said, because conformal symmetry is such a tight symmetry. It relates the smallest and the largest scales together. And if, I am, if I'm not mistaken, the past 40 years, one part of the astrophysics community has been trying to do exactly that, try to find some theory of dark matter that will explain galaxies and that will explain the accelerating expansion of the universe and so on and so forth. And if, I don't know where we are. I mean, <laughs> we hope that they will find the, uh, supersymmetry, but there isn't any supersymmetry. So as far as I know now, the dark matter candidates range from 100 solar mass black holes that created in the early evolution of the universe to particles with masses 10 to the minus 22 EV. 
<laughs> that is a rather, uh, what should I say, a, a satisfactory uh, state of affairs and everything in between. You can make anything, any dark matter that ranges from 10 to minus 22 EV to 100 solar mass black holes, and, uh, that would do for you. Of course, then you have to take into account dark energy to explain the acceleration of the universe. And of course, you take the acceleration of the universe in, in face value, then you realize that the Hubble constant, there's something I didn't talk about, it's not consistent if you measure it locally with the supernova or you measure it from the CMB. There's a discrepancy of a close to five sigma now. One value is near 68 and the other one near 73 with the error bars getting smaller and smaller as the uh, observations uh, improve. So on the other hand, here's a theory that extremely tight. I don't understand everything. I don't understand <laughs> maybe anything, but there are indications here that all these things are in some sense related as they should. And uh, maybe that's what we should basically uh, spend a little more uh, effort exploring. So let me kind of uh, sum conclude with my uh, uh, summary and the general conclusions. There is mounting evidence, I say quite a bit of, that uh, there's a presence of characteristic acceleration of order CH0 in the astrophysical data, especially in the dynamics of visualized objects. Uh, it is of interest that such an acceleration occurs in the solution of a fourth order conformal invariant theory of gravity. My belief is, and that's the essence of this talk, that this is not coincidental. And I, I uh, insist on conformal because the gamma R term, it's a conformal degree of freedom. If you take another fourth order theory, it, it will certainly have KR square in there. Uh, the R alpha alpha square, it gives you a KR square. Uh, we've, I've solved this equation. so. Uh, you can get Swartz in the sitter, but without the gamma R term. The gamma R term is, it's, uh, it's uh, necessary, well, derives from the local conformal invariance. So the application of theory to astrophysics, again, what I've just been saying now, requires that we have the physics behind, understand the physics behind Newton's constant G, which is absent in the purely fourth order theory. You don't want to, one thing you don't want to do, you don't want to have conformal theory plus Einstein Hilbert <laughs> because then uh, you might as well forget about the conformal uh, theory of gravity and just stick to Einstein. Once you understand this, then, then we'll be able to find out how we can reduce the fourth order equations at, at what approximation the fourth order equations can become second order because what we have instead of the, the full fourth order uh, uh, Laplacian will have something that depends on scale with the second order Laplacian equal to rho. And then we'll be able to see what terms, uh, what of the fourth, which of the fourth order terms that I wrote down there, they, they can be dropped out. And now we'll have something that we can really use astrophysically. Okay, so far now we use Newton and Newton has a constant G. And that takes care of the, uh, of the dimensions of the Laplacian times one over G equal to rho. That's, uh, and they, so the point I try to insist on is that the constant in front of the Laplace operator may not be constant. It will be variable, but not as variable as delf as two more derivatives in the proper regime those derivatives will be slowly varying and therefore they allow you to use second order equations. Uh, now, a conformal symmetry, as I said, it begs the issue of mass generation because naturally connects the micro and the macro scales and uh, implies gravitational effects at the Higgs scale, if indeed it's true, unless there is some variant, in which case avoids all that. And I don't know about it. I use something uh, very simple-minded here. I, I replace the mass of the Higgs with a local, with a conformal coupling. Maybe there are more, com more complicated things that uh, work out. Uh, as I said now, 
that sort of a rather novel insight I had. The universe begins close to conformal environment state, no black holes, it's homogeneous natural tropic. It's impossible, if the theory is correct, it's impossible to produce uh, black holes. Maybe you could produce apparent black holes, but you go near the horizon, then you never cross it. And therefore, there's no black hole evaporation and there's no violation of the unitarity. Maybe uh, some of you who follow the uh, local uh, the science uh, news, you find out there's a big fight there. There was a big fight. The claim has been resolved that the uh, black hole evaporation, because uh, uh, everything that comes out is thermal, has destroyed the unitarity of the field of the, uh, of the state that formed the black hole. Well, if you never form a horizon, you never evaporate. And therefore, unitarity is preserved. And therefore, black holes must be repositories of information. It's the information that's been discarded through the burning of, the, uh, of all the available, all the free energy that was available in the evolution of the universe. It's like what the, the uh, let's say, it's the uh, uh, ashes that are left uh, after you burnt a... Uh, a piece of wood or a piece of coal that had some free energy to give you eventually after the burn is over, you're left only with the ashes. And at this point, you can consider black holes as the ashes of all that burning uh, of that we essentially employed in calculating evolution of the universe. So I think I will stop here and I'll thank you. Oh. Many thanks. To, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, many thanks, uh, Dimos, for all these uh, nice things that you told us. Uh, we are very we enjoyed the talk. Uh, questions. Uh, let me first give uh, uh, ask uh, people in the audience here if they have something to ask, or I will uh, ask people in the from the other. Is there, is there a question? Yeah. Okay, so uh, please, if somebody has to ask uh, something, let me understand that he wants to ask a question. Well, like I said before, you give a seminar, nobody asks a question. It's like nobody <laughs> wants to go with you to the prom. <laughs> <laughs> well. So uh, at, at least I hope it was an enjoyable uh, afternoon for you. <laughs> I would like to ask. Uh, please, please. Yeah, please. go ahead. It, it's Arjiris Nikolaidis. Um, first, I really enjoyed this graph with the mass radius relation. And it looks like a sort of a good sign of uh, the conformal symmetry. I mean, the two well, different scales, and yet, they just follow the same line. The other thing it was coming from the experiment, the LHC experiment, and uh, you mentioned that maybe it's coming from a coupling between the Higgs and two gravitons. I just would like to ask you. No, two graviton, one graviton. One graviton? Well, what is it? Yeah, the actual gravity ball. The gravity ball would be basically some system which self-contained by its own gravitational field, but it's only a uh, gravitational field, like what people used to call geon in the past. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I have no idea. I mean, yeah, you guys understand all these things better than I do. It could be a gravitational wave, no, fully nonlinear. But it looks like a, well, the way they do, with, well, I have no idea. I mean, this is a missing energy and missing momentum. So it could it be a wave that has some kind of preferred direction or it could be a particle-like okay, object? Okay, okay, sure. Simply in, in, in the Feynman graph that we actually uh, have seen uh, was something uh, like a Higgs going to two particles and just imagine that maybe- Oh that's... yeah, that, that's right. That was, uh, that's not my, I can show you, I can go back there. Yeah. And um, my, my question is if we start from your theory, the, the conformal symmetry, is there a sort of, of a limit? And from that limit, you actually obtain the Einstein theory. Like we start from Einstein and then we actually go to Newton for, for weak gravity. So in, in your case, well, do you think I don't know a limit what... 
that, that you did Einstein? Einstein has two, two derivatives. The conformal theory has four derivatives. The question, of course, is if that's the true theory, you have to use all four derivatives. And we, we use it in the very specific case, a uh, static spherically symmetric uh, metric. That's the equivalent of the Schwarzschild. Now, and that has now additional constants in there. Now, this is a very specific problem. In Einstein theory, we say, well, yeah, we have a point-like object and then we can put lots of point-like objects and then we can make a, uh, uh, a fluid and then we can make homogeneous isotropic fluid and that's the universe. And then we say, okay, so now we can solve the Einstein Einstein equations for a homogeneous isotropic uh, distribution of matter. Of course, we never have homogeneous isotropic distribution of matter. We only have point particles and we only have the exterior solution of point particles. And if you take only an ensemble of those, you never get uh, a smooth fluid. That's called the einstein strauss uh, construction because the, uh, uh, the friedman robertson walker is a it's not a vacuum solution, solution with matter everywhere. So if far away your uh, Robertson walker, you approach a source, you become vacuum before you hit the source, the exterior solution is after all outside of a proton. You never, we never pack so the protons are on top of each other. Then the metric in the first derivative is continuous, but the second derivative is not. So, uh, simply the uh, structure of the, that's, uh, uh, that's another fine point. The uh, delta function uh, uh, character of the uh, Newtonian sources or the Newton-Einstein sources, if you like, allows you, because it's positive definite, allows you to take a sum of points and homogenize them and use the mean density. You cannot do that with point-like objects whose source, which are derivatives of delta functions. And I don't know, since nature works, eventually maybe there is a way to do that. We just don't know how to do it mathematically at this point. Uh, we have to find the right mathematics so that you can still be able to find something, approximate a fluid with sources which are uh, biogravity sources. The chances are that for small scales of the order of the solar system or a thousand times the solar system, we don't have to worry about the four derivatives. You see, the four derivatives are the problem, not only the uh, distribution of matter at large scales, which is what uh, the uh, Poisson equation does, but you have two more derivatives to point to, to, to probe the interior structure of the sources that make the uh, fluids that you do out there. And the, what I'm really interested in is, is some correct, some approximation scheme at this point, there should be an approximation scheme that allows you to go from the four derivatives into the two derivatives. But now the coefficient of that, it should be constant equal to G in some kind of uh, related uh, distances. But as you go to larger distances or to just distance approach in the uh, black hole horizon, it should be drastically different. That's what I have in mind. And uh, that I haven't done yet. Now, if, you, if indeed all that thing is true, what I said, by the time you go to distances, which are the inverse of the, uh, uh, of the Higgs mass, then, then all four derivatives should be important in calculating the, the structure of those sources, namely the mass of the, the structure of the particles. And what the extra derivatives do in some sense, provide, if you like, the uh, Poincare stresses that hold particles together. If you, so from far away, those particles look like a delta functions, but uh, the Poincare stresses allow them to stretch as the conformal theory, the conformal uh, uh, symmetry wants, because they should be stretchable. So the masses maybe actually are stretchable and maybe they're stretchable to the size of the horizon. We had that discussion in the past because you want to do strings and the string stretches over the entire size of the horizon. Well, maybe that's what happens to all the masses. They stretched over the entire mass of the horizon. So it's not totally massless because the size of the horizon give you never, it gives you a characteristic mass, the Compton wavelength of the black hole. And 
this is the reason that you have all this uh, high uh, entropies for the black hole because you insist on particles which are very, very, has a uh, very small uh, uh, Compton wavelength. They try to build a, uh, I'm sorry, huge Compton wavelength. They try to build a black hole of that mass. So uh, this, uh, this talk was to give some, well, first of all, give an outlet to my thoughts. Uh, but hopefully I will infect some other people with these thoughts so they can go out and <laughs> have some more thoughts and maybe something will come out of it. So if you want to go back to this transparency, so the obvious thing would be to have the uh, Higgs go to two Zs, which go to each of which goes to two neutrinos, and that will be that. This is not my transparency. I borrowed it from somebody. <laughs> and... Uh, this lady, I told you, works for Atlas and now works for uh, the Fermi uh, uh, project. And she's familiar with uh, the, the nuts and bolts of, uh, of uh, detecting particles. So I, was, I thought it was, I had completely forgotten about it. And all of a sudden, I see that all those things indeed are there. And there's some sector of the uh, high energy people uh, high physics people who call those LLPs, long-lived particles. Well, all right. If they can speculate, why, sh why shouldn't I be able to speculate? And it makes it a little sexier too. I mean, it, it, it's big, uh, related to the gravi to, to gravity. Uh, so uh, I also have issue understanding, I mean, the uh, uh, conformal symmetry to some extent. I mean, eventually we do all our calculations in some particular conformal frame. And uh, uh, people in the audience may be more fa familiar than I am about how we go about interpreting those things. I, you may have heard about the Jordan theory. Jordan theory, instead of G, they put a, a field in there instead of the, and they try to solve all that. And they say, well, we do things in the Jordan frame. And then in the Einstein frame, the Einstein frame, the field is constant. Well, that's something what I, I would like to do here. Just see if there's a conformal frame, if you like, that this equation simplify. And therefore, in a, a, an approximate fashion, we can use second order equations, maybe not with a constant G. Uh, it's an open field here. I don't have any answers. I have questions. And all I did is essentially uh, uh, put my questions out in public and see if uh, anybody is interested and anybody has uh, some good ideas. I'm uh, certainly open for discussion and in all those issues. Apparently, there's no field theorist in the audience. Otherwise, I'm sure there were heard objections from them. Okay. I, I also have a question, Please, if I may. Yes, yes. yes sir. So, yeah. um, I, I was so uh, that thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, I'm more uh, what drove my attention is this um, variable G. So what uh, this variable G that you discussed. Yes. Um, so what uh, do you think would be a, a way to manifest observationally uh, well, uh, would it be would it need, be, need for uh, dark matter in galaxies, for example? <laughs> yeah. Okay. If, if you allow me to, to say something on this, uh, this is what I also am puzzled a, a little bit about. So it is looking to the rotation curves of the galaxies. It is obvious that uh, any kind of problem arises in uh, areas where luminous matter is not that dense. Yes. So, how, well, what could, for instance, make it uh, make G? It, it's not the distance. Okay, we. It's not the it, distance. That's the. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's not this the is, Yeah, exactly. It's the yeah. the 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 density of the luminous matter. I would say. So, why can can, can we say that all that is compatible with this observable? Uh, this observable well, if anything system? else, it should be the column density, not the density. The column density. Column that, density. Yeah. Column density. That's why. When the column density becomes comparable to the column density of the universe, then we have deviations of order one from Newton. Okay. That's the, uh, and uh, uh, that's the that amount to uh, Milgram's uh, statement. Then the acceleration becomes smaller than uh, uh, CH naught. Forget about CH naught. 
when the column density becomes smaller than the column density of the universe, then we don't understand the dynamics. Now, the question is, how do we form galaxies to begin with anyway? I mean, uh, these theories don't say anything about the, uh, uh, the formation of galaxies. Is the uh, truly fissure related to the formation or is it related to uh, something which maybe the formation, well, the presume of the galaxies form from fluctuations due the, in the inflationary uh, uh, universe, right? Also, all those things, have, they seem to get involved with each other. Uh, we had the dark matter uh, type approach for uh, 40 years now. Well, maybe a little more than that, but dark matter in terms of uh, WIMPs or Wimpsillas or uh, uh, one I liked was Pyrgons, uh, maybe uh, <laughs> they have the mass of the uh, Planck mass. Uh, there've been lots and lots and lots of names. Uh, as I said, as of now, I listened to a, uh, one of these uh, remote seminars of Aspen. Somebody gave a review of the dark matter and the ranges between 100 solar mass black holes, that's the new Apparently, you're allowed to do that. Uh, some part in the parameter space allows a, a hundred solar mass black holes, uh, which were formed early in the universe. So therefore, uh, they only served as dark matter. They didn't have any pressure. Down to uh, particles, which are, I forget now, but the number I have in mind is 10 to the minus 22 EV. Come on. <laughs> a theory should be a little bit uh, more approximately uh, more accommodating, less accommodating than that. I mean, so that's a question. So you ask me a question, how, what's the evidence? Well, here's the evidence. We had the evidence for many years now and we call it dark matter. We call it now, we call it dark energy. And uh, unless I, and those are very, very difficult measurements. You know, the cosmological measurements are very, very hard to do, very hard to interpret. So the question is, uh, yeah, everybody agrees that we have dark energy, but uh, so what we have here, we have a fit of the uh, uh, redshift magnitude relation. I mean, and it's it fits well with a, putting a kr square term in the uh, lambda term, if you like, in in the equations. But uh, we're far away from really calling that the theory in some sense. I don't know how uh, things will evolve, and I don't know how to explain all that. I mean, nobody asked me questions about cosmology. First of all, you cannot do cosmology. Uh, Friedman Robertson Walker, purely Friedman Robertson Walker cosmology, you cannot do the fourth order theory because it gives you zero equals zero. The, uh, the Friedman uh, universe, the homogeneous isotropic about all points, is a conformally flat universe. So if you plug it into the uh, gravitational equations, you get identity, zero, which means that your team you knew has to be zero. Uh, now, they has to be zero in a conformally coupled field. And my uh, friend, Philip Mannheim, tried to make a cosmology out of that because uh, if you want to put a conformally coupled field equal to zero, the team you knew for a conformally coupled field equal to zero, it, uh, that contains our alpha alpha in there and it gives you equations. So he had some equations and people who do nuclear synthesis, they use those equations, they found out that is, uh, you can get helium because helium is very hard not to make an expanding universe, make no deuterium at all. So uh, that universe, if indeed is a universe, uh, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not conducive to uh, observation. So. As I said, we do need some, some new ideas. Uh, now, my ideas, unfortunately, are shoehorned in this conformal invariants. Uh, because if it works with that, it'll be a very, very tight theory. That's, the, that's why. That's why this is important to have some new ideas along this direction, because automatically we have a connection between the microscopic and the macroscopic. You cannot avoid that. Uh, if the theory is some other theory, then you can play around with dark matter, you play with dark energy, and then you take, uh, well, I suppose you use extra dimensions to make Einstein, but there have been thousands of papers with that, right? I mean, so what is the, uh, the upshot? 
I've heard names which I don't really understand now, but uh, both on the gravitational sector and the matter sector. Uh, and there's active, uh, active uh, research on both directions. And I don't know what, uh, uh, so what is the answer? And here we have a theory that we start from the, uh, uh, with the local invariance principle, all the math, and all of a sudden you get a mass radius relation. That seems to be obeyed. Now, we don't understand the dynamics, but, but once you do the correct step in that direction, then you understand everything. That's the point. You will not have wiggle room. Now you have wiggle room. All of a sudden, the 100 solar mass black hole is the dark matter. And, uh, and people work actively on, on, on that particular issue. Now, can you ever form a black hole in the expanding universe? It's not clear. You have to, uh, you have to have perturbations which are very large. So yes, uh, the horizon of a, the, uh, uh, the, hor the mass inside the ho expanding horizon in the early universe is equal to the Schwarzschild horizon. If that thing, that piece of matter was sitting by itself, it would form a black, it would form a black hole. But it's not by itself. That's the point. <laughs> it has the, the rest of the universe to contend with. And uh, it's not clear that you can really form a black hole. Uh, Hawking and Bernard Carr worked on that. And my understanding by reading their papers, because I was a referee in other papers, you have to really have very large perturbations. Uh, and it's not so easy to really form a black hole in a homogeneous isotropic universe simply because of the rest of the universe that affects whatever you have locally. So. Uh, Okay. Uh, let, let me see if there is, is anybody else who wants to ask something because we have a well, any, any thoughts. I mean, we are uh, or whatever, is, uh, comment or it's, whatever. A, it's an afternoon. Uh, I hope that you, it was a pleasant afternoon for you. <laughs> Certainly, yes. <laughs> and uh, did I uh, wish all the Dimitris that they... Oh, uh, yeah, there are many. I don't know if there is some... I don't know. Well, yes. I... Uh, <laughs> yes. I know Dimitris Papadopoulos is there, and maybe Christodoulos. Yeah, 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 yeah. If there's anybody yeah, else to call Dimitris... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if, I don't know if there's any other Dimitris around. Uh, same wishes from all of us. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you. <laughs> But uh, uh, if there anyway, are no comments, I, et cetera, I'm afraid we have to stop here because there are also recording issues, I see. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's okay. This will be, that's fine. This will be in Speculation, any Speculations are actually welcome yes, here. Of course, that's of the, course. Anything, anything. Uh, uh, if uh, anyone want, would like to, to consult the, the talk again, it will be in some days or so on the webpage of uh, our research institute here. Uh, if I don't see anyone, uh, anybody else who wants to say something, then we may stop here. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dimos. For, uh, thank you. Uh, I thank everybody for the, for the thank patience. You very much. Uh, uh,